and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. The Union Cabinet recently approved the new National Education Policy 2020 to bring large-scale transformational reforms in both school and higher education. The new education policy for the country comes after almost 34 years. It stipulates for a complete overhaul of the existing education system. Among the key highlights of NEP 2020 is the decision to make home language, mother tongue or regional language as the medium of instruction up to class 5. Experts believe this may create a long-term impact in nation building. Imparting school education in mother tongue or regional language may bring drastic changes in the ongoing process of human resource development. Analysts believe regional languages help inculcate human values and emotions and learning mother tongue will also help future generations forge a relation with their own social and cultural fabric. In this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyze the importance of vernacular languages, culture and values in the NEP 2020. Joining me on the program today are Dr. Shakila Shamsu, former OSD National Education Policy, Shukumar Belawadi, founder Omnio Future Academy, and Vikram Sampath, historian and author. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. All right, Dr. Shakila, I'd like to begin the program with you first. Let's first try and understand the importance of vernacular languages and the mother tongue in primary education. Yeah, so as I would like to emphasize, thank you first for actually having a discussion on a very uh, emotive topic, at the same time very, very critical to the national education policy itself. Uh, multilingualism has been an underlying principle of this policy. In fact, if uh, you've read the document which is now there on the MHRD website, we have outlined certain principles of this policy and multilingualism and using the power of language for integration and for strengthening understanding of Indian culture and values has the underlying foundation of this policy. Now, if we have to do that, we need to actually understand that children learn languages at a very young age. Unlike the common perception that as you do older, you start to learn language. So we have tried to say that, of course, you are aware that we have also tried to say that we will start with early child care education. But at that stage, we are not talking in terms of really trying to do on the language building. But at the primary stage, we have said that we would like to have the medium of instruction as much as possible in the mother tongue. The idea was merely because the child is used, I mean all of us know that we are first familiar with the words that our mother has spoken to us and therefore the home language or the local language that is largely what the child is most comfortable in. And therefore to emphasize on that point, we have said that in primary school that is, we are not using the word primary because we are having four stages, the 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4. So in the very tender foundational level that we are talking, that is between the ages of 3 to 8, we are trying to really say that children should learn in their own language or their regional language or their mother tongue. Okay, points taken. Let me take the points that you are making uh, forward, Mr. Belwadi. Mr. Belwadi. You know, uh, Dr. Shakila talking about, you know, how younger children have a greater capability to learn languages. Let's talk about that aspect now. How capable are children in the age group of, say, 6 to 12 to learn about ancient knowledge of India? That's something that the new education policy is talking about. And also multiple languages along with everything else that they would be expected to learn. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, here's the point. Uh, to take your second question first, which is uh, the aspect of uh, how many languages are the children capable of learning, you know. Uh, first and foremost, it's a fact today, um, significant amount of research which has proved this, that children are indeed capable of learning multiple languages. In fact, uh, the record which uh, certain authorities are putting out is about 18, what children can pick up. But we know from a cultural perspective, from an ancient uh, wisdom, that it's much more than 18. So that said, there is indeed a built-in capability with children to pick up more and more languages. The question arises about what indeed is the ancient aspect which we are talking about and how do you integrate that into the reality of the learning ability of a child and which includes the language learning ability. First and foremost, uh, we need to recognize today that uh, 
much of the learning capacity is built up only in this early period now today you have the world bank and you have the uh, who unicef all of them talking about the nurturing care framework and early childhood period, which is up to the age of 8 and specifically within that you have uh, 0 being focused through the nurturing care framework now this is a public document of who now this document very clearly emphasizes that if you tap into the potential or build potential at this time this is the one which is going to give a holistic capability to an individual across all spectrums meaning you know the physical the emotional the intellectual the sensorial all perspectives in which education is required those potencies and all those cap- capacities are developed in a child through the course of early learning early potential building exercises if undertaken so that brings us to the moot point about where do you begin and the most interesting aspect is that the earlier you begin the better it is and therefore i can only invoke uh, you know one of the notable uh, scientists who actually produced a number for this you have uh, James Heckman the Nobel laureate producing a number he tells you that if you invest 1 dollar in the preschool age that is before the age of 4 5 you get a return of up to 13 dollars if you invest in the school going age which is typically up to the age of 15 16 you get a return of 1 to 4 dollars which comes down dramatically as you have seen 13 14 dollars to 3 to 4 dollars and if you invest above 18 you get a return of less than 1 dollar so where should state policy be really funding the earlier you invest the greater is the potential building greater is the capacity building so if you start early you are you are able to infuse all the learning abilities which includes the language learning ability as well all right then so let me take the discussion forward and bring in another aspect vikram what i'd like to uh, take up with you is of course we've discussed to the last 7 or 8 minutes or so that the highlights or one of the highlights of this particular policy is the focus on the mother tongue as a medium of instruction however considering where we are at right now we are talking about globalization we are talking about an integrated world how practical is it to move away from english or shed shed english and focus on our mother tongue and these vernacular languages thank you frank and thank you for inviting me to such an important discussion and quite coincidentally uh, you know i was part of the committee which uh, in fact it was my the chapter that i wrote on the inclusion of art uh, culture elements and also on languages uh, for the nep and i i was just plodding through the final version of the report and was quite pleasantly surprised to see that a lot of the recommendations that i had made in that chapter uh, eventually got accepted now the basic premise with which i even started that chapter and we had the discussions uh, among the team members was uh, you know dating back to that uh, infamous and quite dreaded uh, uh, ed- education minute of thomas uh, macaulay uh, dating back to 1835 where the entire premise of education in india especially in english education was to produce the little uh, you know brown sahibs who were indian only in blood but uh, english in their taste in their knowledge in their opinion in their sensibilities and it's we keep talking about this several times uh, but then 70 years after independence precious little was being done to actually correct that uh, that move so i don't uh, see a dichotomy between the fact that there is uh, there is a stress that is given uh, to to the mother tongue we can discuss as to how difficult that is particularly in a country like india where there are multiple mother tongues uh, you know in a state like i come from a uh, multilingual background uh, i live in a state uh, uh, in karnataka which uh, who, the language of which is not my mother tongue so someone if a child like me who has multiple um, you know parents with multiple linguistic backgrounds what would happen to that where, where would be the mother tongue so all these are the devil is always in the detail but i'm talking about the larger intent which is to infuse that sense of uh, you know um, uh, ownership and the sense of pride in one's own culture and heritage and one's lang- linguistic uh, inheritance uh, and these two i think can coexist it need not be either or where uh, it is at the cost of english or it's at the cost of uh, you know uh, the mother tongue uh, now there's also i think a larger altruistic and a societal responsibility which uh, in fact in that chapter we prefaced it with the uh, linguistic survey people survey of linguistic uh, uh, indians uh, which was done in 2017 which actually showed that almost 10% you know of the world's 4000 languages which face an extinction threat in the next 50 years are being spoken in india 
and 780 languages that were surveyed across 27 states of which 400 were most likely to go extinct but then there was also one positive news of that survey which said that several languages which are quite unknown you know i mean like samtali gondi which is spoken in odisha chhattisgarh maharashtra there's bheli which is spoken in Mahar uh, again maharashtra rajasthan gujarat mizo in mizoram uh, garo and khasi in uh, meghalaya Kot Barak in Tripura, all these languages, dialects were actually showing an upward trend in terms of the growth in the last few years. And the main right. reason for this was that educated people in these languages were starting to write plays, poems, novels and stories in those languages. So, you so, know, Bhojpuri with its film industry, uh, it's probably one of the country's fastest growing languages. So I think the onus of the education system is not like what Macaulay said to produce little brown sahibs to today a uh, mass production of uh, coders and software engineers which are certainly important but also in the largest uh, milieu place them in the indian cultural context the problem as i prefaced earlier was that who defines what this mother tongue is how do you get the uh, the absence of quality textbooks and reading material particularly you know and terminologies too in indian languages in the sciences in medicine in engineering so all that needs to be done and even you know those who uh, opt for studying uh, these languages as first language, they are handicapped by these limitations. So uh, while, while the intent is great, I mean, now the next step, which is the more difficult part, is the implementation at various levels. Absolutely. I'll come to, uh, I'll come to you know, that particular aspect just a little uh, ahead in the program. You know, uh, uh, Doctor, I'd like to come and speak to you about that particular aspect about implementation. But before that, you know, since we're talking about languages, let's talk about this one historic problematic uh, issue that we've had of this three language formula and you know do you expect that to continue to be a problem how can we address that particular issue uh, i don't think frank uh, on the three language formula i just like to put in perspective that it is not something new it's been there in fact the language policy has been uh, outlined to the best extent by the Kothari Commission report, which got reflected in the 1968 policy. The 86 policy merely re, uh, endorsed those recommendations to say that you would have, you know, the north of India learning a language which is not Hindi, so it has to be a regional language from the southern state. Now, we all know that the entire southern India has English, has Hindi, and it has its own regional language. But as far as the North is concerned, it has confined itself to English and Hindi, Hindi being the regional language and not having taken up a third language. What we have tried to do in this, so in effect, the three language formula has never been implemented in this country. It has only been there on paper. It is one of unimplemented critical recommendations of both the 68 and the 86 policy which has only been implemented by a part of this country and a large part of this country has not implemented a three language formula. Having said that, this particular policy has realized the pragmatism of trying to say that we need to promote the three language formula because you can't rock anything that you touch on language as I said in the beginning. Uh, thank you for calling me for a very emotive topic because this is the one which plays up the maximum. Mm. It's the closest to our heart. It touches our culture. And so you know, we have only tried to bring about a degree of flexibility without trying to say anything except that even within these three languages, we have said one, the person was the child, the student would have the flexibility to choose the languages subject to the availability of the teachers in that school. And we have only said that you should learn two native Indian languages. So the third could be English, or uh, which automatically could be English, and any two other native Indian languages, rather than taking up a foreign language. Now, while we have said that, we have not at any point, and let me say the 68 policy also, not only said that English would be promoted along with Sanskrit, Hindi, but also international languages. Because right from 68, it has been very forward looking and trying to say that if we want our students to start going out of India, then you will have to allow them to learn various other foreign languages also. In that sure. same spirit, we have said beyond class 7, the child can take up more, not just the two native Indian languages and 
English, but any other foreign languages. But none of this has imposition of a language. That is what distinguishes the three language formula that we are talking about from the earlier two ones. That it is made flexible so that there is a choice that is being given to the student depending upon the class in which the student is. And mm. being a concurrent list subject, we have allowed the states to make a decision as to which they would find to do best. In the last three days, from July 29th of the uh, the approval of the policy, state governments are trying to grapple, as much as we are trying to grapple also. How sure. can people are mapping the language teachers' requirements to meet this 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 recommendation? Because as far as possible, it's not to be there as, only as an intent. It has to be there for implementation to the best True. extent possible. True. Okay. So, all right then, uh, you know, uh, Ms. Palwadi, let me let me take up a point that uh, Vikram Sampath was making earlier. You know, this issue about do we have, uh, you know, the right kind of people who can teach these kind of things at such a young age? Because let's not forget that is it is also important not only to get this knowledge, but also to see where we are getting this knowledge from. You know, it's uh, not everybody. It's not it's not everybody's cup of tea. Indeed, indeed. Uh, you know, you've touched on a very important point. You know, the first thing which I was really appreciative was uh, removing the focus from 10 plus 2 plus 3, 10 being the starting block to making it 5 plus 3 plus whatever. So now the emphasis obviously has become to the first, the early, the parlance of the five, right? Now, what is it that uh, is required there? We are very happy to note that the focus of trying to build capacity is there by try, trying to into what they need to teach the child before going to school or at the preschool stage, trying to build a centralized framework wherein teachers would also get about what kind of education they need to be giving children is going to happen. The moot question for me would be, what indeed is going to be the content which is going to get in there? Because this is a necessary component. However, the curriculum is going to make the difference because what is being taught is as important as who is going to teach. Now, given that reality, we need to integrate a lot of things into this. I know from my experience running these uh, educational institutions, which are unfortunately called you know, the alternate education, which uh, in reality should be the main focus because you're giving a holistic opportunity for development of a child. The things which you need to inculcate in children. Now, if you shift the focus to the five category, the first of the uh, blocks, right? You need to build significant capacities in terms of upping the learning potential. At a second level, what are the things which the child needs at that point of time should be known to both the teachers as well as the parents? How are you going to bring that about? Unless and until you integrate the modern, uh, what you call as modern science with ancient wisdom, you will really not be getting a good perspective of what is really required for the child, what indeed is the capacity of the child, and what you need to inculcate into the child at that point of time. So if you take the, the foundational things which are required for the child, I don't think any parent today is qualified to give that to the child today. For instance, you know a reality that uh, children who are at the age of, you could call them minor adults or young adults at the age of 18, 20, those adults are found to be having emotional maturity of six to eight years old. How are you going to you know, bridge that gap? How are you going to make that mismatch disappear? It has to start with empowerment of the teachers themselves. So empowerment of the teachers, the right curriculum, mixing it together to produce the next generation of children who are in turn going to you know, empower the subsequent generations. That's the game. So is it available? All the knowledge is available with us. We know through with our, with our children and empirically in many other countries which we have seen. We know it is possible. We can start doing it. We are very, very happy that the policy has actually taken a very progressive step to make it open, to make the system open, to make learning easily accessible and people to combine subjects. So a whole lot of goods in the policy. And we see this as the stepping stone for building those capacities which are innately Indian, which are innately ancient wisdom and combine it with modern science to make it a very good concoction, the right combination, which is necessary for the future of both India and the world, because it's it's in all parameters, whether it's the individual parameter, familiar, the societal, the global or the universal, every perspective gets integrated. The moment you start integrating ancient wisdom 
with modern sciences and you have a game there and it's known that our system of uh, education uh, not the last 3 400 years of course but preceding that has stood the test of time and delivered for so many millennia not to talk of centuries and i'm sure that it will come back again and do what is required for uh, the future of mankind itself okay all right taking the discussion forward then you know vikram let's bring in another aspect uh, you know the policy says children will be given a logical framework for making ethical decisions now how do you choose what is ethical and what is unethical something that is ethical to you may be unethical to me and vice versa so now that is going to be you know a problem there and i see some issues cropping up on that front well uh, i mean as i said a lot, a lot of policy statements are uh, are just that they are policy statements how and how to implement that uh, becomes another issue and how the the devil is always in the detail but i'd like to touch upon frank with your uh, permission another Please important aspect when we are talking about this which is the which i think is a very important part of this uh, policy which is the integration of uh, the arts uh, you know and uh, expressions of art into the larger uh, rubric of education and you know our education has always stressed on only one of the uh, three pillars in my view which is the iq the in, uh, intellectual quotient whereas the eq the emotional quotient and if i may add an sq a spiritual quotient uh, especially in a country like ours which has been the cradle of spirituality for the world Uh, i think these are very very important but absent components of our education system so to say till now and what better uh, you know ingredients to bring these other quotients which were missing in our education system than through the rubric of our arts uh, you know whether it's performing arts visual arts and so on so in fact way back in the in 2006 you had unesco's uh, first world conference on arts and culture education which actually put out a road map on this and said cultural awareness and expression Uh, was one of the eight uh, you know key competencies that had to be developed in a child now in a country like india where like languages there are multiple art forms multiple you know music and dance and folk traditions and all of that so what is it that we do so the idea is not uh, according to the policy uh, an idea to pr- produce you know world class musicians dancers painters and all that i think uh, uh, we try to put this thing itself as a three uh, three staged uh, you know pyramid where one is of course uh, a knowledge based uh, you know component which kind of teaches the children the best of what has been created and is being currently created in the creative uh, space within the country so for instance today if you just show a child a tanpura a sitar a veena uh, i don't know if they'll be able to identify these instruments uh, whether they'll be able to know which are the eight uh, dance classical dance forms of india what is the uh, folk art of say uh, mayurbhanj or purulia and all of this so The, uh, this knowledge based component which just makes them aware of you know glimpses into the great literature of our own country right from the ancient to medieval to modern times in classical and regional languages art architecture films classical folk music dance forms drama all of that bringing a, a knowledge part of it that's one part which i think a lot of you know informally it was being done through organizations like say spikmake uh, the society for promotion of indian classical music and culture amongst youth which were bringing all these people to artists and scholars to students there is now i think the move is to institutionalize it and scale it up through government intervention making it more widespread and accessible the second part which is important is to actually and that's where i think the analytical and critical faculty also where worldwide studies have shown that if you teach even you know complicated subjects whether it is mathematics or geometry or physics and uh, other things through uh, through the arts through music through dance and i'm sure mr belwadi who talks of a uh, you know uh, the alternative education would agree that through these different uh, ways the knowledge the the education can Uh, need not be a burden on the children and it's also not this rote learning that they've always been exposed to and worldwide studies have shown that it enhances the grasping power the iq of the children significantly when it is taught right. through all these other means so that's sure. the second part of the pyramid and the last part of the pyramid is of course the skill based component where you know someone who's really talented actually gets into a particular art form and learns and becomes uh, you know a, a world fa- we also produce or look at producing some of the world's best uh, dancers sculptors filmmakers and theater artists closing comments in the, the program i've got limited time about 3 minutes so in 1 minute each the best way forward starting first with you dr shakila implementation is going to be the key 
the proof of the pie is in its eating yes uh, frank i would say that uh, we are already on the track we've already got a framework to go about doing the implementation first in terms of mapping the manpower as well as mapping out the domain strength of the institutions now the for the and uh, to be very frank the intent has been accepted that itself has helped us in actually moving forward because i think most of our educational institutions whether they are schools or higher education institutions in the feedback that we have have accepted that we need to have a holistic individual in which there is a subsuming of all the potentials including like dr vikram vikram has been mentioning rather than putting them at a hierarchy that if you are learning a particular profession that is treated as better and the other one not being treated as better okay all right mr balwadi best way forward well the very foundation of education if it's supposed to be sa vidya ya vimukta is deliverance i see that as making it as broad or as visionary as possible if you really want to empower a human being through those phases you have to begin with self confidence which in turn implies self empowerment now what is the self that has never been addressed through all the educational curriculum till date everywhere across the world while the world health organization as also unicef are speaking about uh, you know 0 to 3 plus early childhood up to the age of 8 etc nobody really has a mechanism of how to address that through curriculum and through empowerment of parents and teachers to deliver this to the child this is where we as indians have a significant edge if we are able to capitalize on this if we are able to bring this together to make sure that we integrate holistic holistic way of empowerment which is through the mechanism of ancient wisdom and modern sciences that is where the key is the policy has gone a long way in terms of opening up the gates but in terms of implementation we all need to work together to make sure that much of what has been thought about gets implemented and some of these gaps which are there you know like uh, i truly believe that while india has signed the uh, nurturing care framework but much of what is desired through the nurturing, nurturing care framework in the age group of 0 3 doesn't find a place anywhere even as of date okay so okay. we need to move further ahead uh, on these fronts as well thank you all right and uh, vikram close the show for us with your concluding remarks yeah that's always the toughest part right frank so but uh, maybe <laughs> i'll resort to probably what uh, swami vivekananda had said about 100 years ago and it sadly it has been true for so long where he pointed out that the defect of present day education as it stood at his time was that it had no definite goal or purpose he said a sculptor has a clear idea of what she wants to shape out of the marble rock similarly a painter knows what she wants to paint but then a teacher unfortunately doesn't seem to have any goal in what she wishes to make of the children and that's what swami ji had said then and the end of all education he had opined was man making which is manifesting in our lives as perfection which is the very nature of our inner self now uh, i'm glad that after so many years we finally looking to an in india centric kind of an education policy which also looks not merely you know there's this there's a very thin line be- between uh, pride for your nation and the jingoistic uh, you know chest thumping that can go around so but then genuinely do children of our of uh, our generation know what is it about our country that we can be genuinely proud of what is it uh, what are all the knowledge systems that have been bequeathed to us what are all the inheritances which rightfully belong to us as a nation uh, and which we can uh, be proud of and also improvise further and give to ourselves and to the rest of the world i think that india centric uh, focus was long missing in such in you know 70 years after freedom so i think this uh, the policy in its intent as dr shakila mentioned addresses that of course uh, there will be number of uh, hiccups in terms of how it uh, implements in a country as vast as ours with so many uh, you know lacunae that we have the lack of manpower the lack, we, we can say we want uh, language teachers or we want arts educators but where do we find the teachers what do we do for the teacher training so all these details i think once the intent is clear then i think the road map as to how to reach that goal would come uh, in the months and years ahead and uh, i'm glad that at least the intent has been formalized now through this policy okay all right on that note then i'll call it a wrap on this edition of the big picture thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us so what's coming out of this discussion is that the nep 2020 is a step in the right direction and after a long wait of 30 decades education in our country is going to see 
a large scale improvement there are of course certain limitations like lack of infrastructure and adept teachers but that can be worked out if all stakeholders come together and work out some kind of a formula for the months and years to come ancient wisdom combined with modern sciences is going to help the students and young minds in a great deal and this is something that we need to keep in mind and we all have to move forward is what the panelists are suggesting with that it's a wrap see you again next time